This is our lecture number seven and it will be about uh, data flow analysis. Now we're getting to uh, the most difficult areas of our course which are about the actual analysis of programs of how can we uh, by looking at the program say something which uh, which uh, a programmer uh, well intended to put there and uh, the computer may understand it without running it we we are basically are interested in a static uh, analysis of the programs by as you remember the static means that uh, we uh, we don't run the program we only look at the code of the program and by the code we make a decision of what is there so there are a number of methods we're going to discuss uh, on this lecture there will be about data flow analysis the next one will be about symbolic execution and the next one will be uh, model checking and then the last one we will see I still still to decide uh, what what's going to be there so this one we're going to discuss data flow analysis first we will start with an example motivating example I'll show you some interesting uh, pieces of the code which we, we will try to analyze then I will describe you the method of data flow analysis I'm not going to dive into all the details because it's definitely not enough one lecture is definitely not enough to explain everything but at least I will give you the overview of the method so then after that you will be able to uh, to make your own decision whether you need it or you don't and then a brief discussion of so-called sensitivities of uh, data flow analysis uh, methods and finally we will discuss most common types of analysis where data flow analysis is used and again those are going to be uh, a good examples for you for further research so let's start from motivating example take a look at the code on the screen there are two pieces of code on the left side on the right side they're almost exactly the same so first look at them and see whether you see any problems with that and um, let's say you run that code and what's going to be the behavior of it there, there, there there's a definition of a function the function oops sorry the function f in both cases and uh, uh, the function accepts the parameter x which is an integer and then according to the variable to the value of the x it either uh, assigns something to the number 42 to a or uh, or it doesn't assign it and then uh, then it makes the the loop uh, it tries to increase the number of this x and while increasing it's going to assign x to a over and over again there's nothing interesting in this code but the question is whether it's okay to have the variable a in a so-called unassigned state so here when we declare the variable a we don't assign any any value to it so we don't put anything into the memory where the variable is located and we only put the, the value there only at this line and that line but these lines they may not necessarily be executed when we reach this line so when we get to the final line and we try to add one to the variable a then it's quite possible that what's inside the a is so-called undefined or unassigned so it means that depending on the programming language there could be different things there so if it's c language for example then it's unpredictable what's going to be in the variable a it's not going to be a big problem here for the functionality because no matter what is there it's still an integer and an integer plus one is going to be just undefined behavior of the function x of the function f which is not good you know from the perspective of uh, of a quality of code but it's not uh, it's not fatal for the functionality so the code will still continue to run however static analysis uh, data flow analysis can help us to identify that situations and tell us that look you programmers you probably forgot to assign something to the variable a so that's that's a warning at least maybe it's not an error but it's at, at least it's a warning coming from a static analyzer so pay attention to it and put something into a on the right code we have exactly the same situation however if you look closer to this code you will see that in the code on the right you will have uh, the problem is not there so the code on the right will always assign a to something 
So if x is more than 3, then a will be assigned. If x is less than 3, uh, then, uh, then a will be assigned here anyway, because in the loop, we're going to reach uh, the, this line anyway. So if it's more than 3, then a will be assigned. If x is less than 3, it means it definitely is less than 12. So this line will, be, will happen. So either this line or that one will definitely happen. And that means for us what? It means that a will definitely be assigned. So this situation is okay and this one is an error. And the static analysis, the data flow analysis, can help us to identify, to distinguish between the left situation and the right situation. And the, 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 the static analyzer may say, may, may, may issue this kind of warning. So you use unassigned variable. That's just the, the idea of what it's about. What it's for. So it's like an assistant for a programmer who is looking at the code and using the method of analysis, which we'll discuss now, it can go through the code without executing it and it will say, look, here's an error. Something is wrong, you didn't assign the variable, so, so change it. Let's compare, that's just for fun, just let's compare what are the... Uh, let's, first, let's give this code to ChatGPT. You know, the system quite popular now, so I gave this piece of code to ChatGPT, the left one, with the, with the bug. And this is what ChatGPT told me. So ChatGPT actually managed to see the problem and it says the variable A is not initialized if the condition blah blah blah. So it explains in quite good level of details, it explains what's going on and why there is a bug. And even in the end, it suggests a fix. So maybe you don't see here, but here on this line it suggests uh, make it like this, int A equals to zero. So it says make it like this, instead of just int A make it int a equals to zero. In this case, the, the, the problem is gone. So ChatGPT understands quite well what's going on. How they do it, I don't know. It's definitely not data flow analysis. It's some magic inside ChatGPT, which we are not going to discuss in this course. But maybe in some other courses you, you learn about it. But we can look at what uh, Clunk Tidy is doing. Clunk Tidy, Clunk, oop, sorry, Clunk, Tidy. Clunk Tidy is a static analyzer which is uh, actually which can actually identify this problem in the code. So I pass that code to the to the Clunk, uh, Clunk Tidy analyzer, which is quite popular for C++ world for C and C++. And this is the information it gave me back. Actually, this is the output which is coming from. Uh, they are not using, to, in my understanding, they are not using data flow analysis. They are using symbolic execution, another way of, an, of, of, static analy of statically analyzing the code. But the output they give is also quite interesting. They even explain what's going on. So they are saying that the variable a is um, uh, again not declared properly without initial value, and because of that, they go through the code and they even look at the, at the situation with the branches. So they explain here. Assuming x is less than 10, so they make some assumptions, they take the branches, they go through the branches, and they, in the end, uh, this is the explanation. So this part of the text is the explanation of the, of the message here. So they put in the message, they say the left operand of plus is a garbage value. So they start from the last line. So they point to the last line of the code and they say, uh, look, uh, you see they say the line, the line 12. So they say the line 12, A is a garbage value. They're not saying uninitialized or undefined. They say garbage. It means that the garbage is there in memory. That the piece of memory which is occupied by this variable contains some garbage. There could be zeros, there could be anything, we don't know. And then we're trying to add, uh, and this is a warning, pay attention. It's a warning. So it's not a bug. So the compiler doesn't complain. So if I ask Clunk to compile this code, there will be no issues. The compiling happens and I can even run the code and code will work. And actually the code will work without any bugs. So the code will just take this garbage value from memory, uh, increment it by one and return the results. We don't know what's going to be the result. It's going to be unpredictable. It's not going to be one. 
uh, because we don't know what was there, but it's not going to cause any functional problems, any, any uh, runtime issues. That's why it's a warning. So when we ask Clunk Tidy to analyze, the static analyzer is telling us that pay attention to that. You can ignore this warning and still continue to work with the code. Everything will be more or less okay, but you can pay attention to it. So ChatGPT is definitely, well, it's definitely smarter. So if you give a more complex code to ChatGPT, it will even describe you more and give you more details. Again, how they do it, it's a, it's a mystery for me. But we're going to not, we're not discussing it this now. We're discussing a more um, deterministic methods of static analysis. This is, in my opinion, non-deterministic. So it depends on many factors and uh, it depends on many uh, ins and outs in this model, in this large language model, so-called. So how they, how they generate the code as an output code, it's a, it's a def different story. And let's take a look how dynamic analysis can help us with this, uh, with this case. Remember, we discussed dynamic analysis before. Dynamic analysis is more or, li more or less like, um, like, uh, um, uh, like testing. So we just run the code and we see the output in runtime. We see what's going to, what's going to the output be. And we can use so-called uh, undefined behavior uh, Oh, probably I'm wrong. Maybe this is not the right name. I tried to use this one. Sorry. So, but in reality, I'm using uh, memory sanitizer. It's a, it's a, it's a typo in the slide. So I'm using memory sanitizer and uh, how do I do it? I compile. So let's take a look at this. Uh, first, I create uh, the, the, the C code. It's exactly the same as you saw before. And then I compile it with the flag uh, you see there is a flag here, which called sanitize. Uh, it means that when, I, when the code is compiled, then there is an extra functionality being injected into the code. So it's not anymore my code, it's the code plus some other extra code. And then when I run the code on this, on this final, uh, the, the third command, it prints me the output, which explains, which, which is a, a runtime um, problem signal, so it's a failure in runtime, and it explains why there is a failure. It says use, you see here, use of uninitialized value. The same situation, but not statically. So we detected this error, but not during the static analysis, but only after when the execution already happened. So this is the last resort. Remember we discussed it before. So static analysis is like your first step when you uh, still have the luxury to uh, to get the bugs, to understand where the problems are before your customers can see that. So you still have time for that. And that's where you use static analysis. When there is no time, when you already have to ship the code, when you already don't know how to uh, understand what the problem is, maybe the static anal analysis already failed, so the static analysis do not, uh, do not provide enough information, then you say, okay, I give up. I inject these, um, these checkers, these sanitizers into the code, compile it again, run it, and then in production, because this will happen in production, right? This execution. It's, it's when the customers, not maybe the customers, maybe you, but usually it happens with the real users when you just give the user uh, your product with the sanitizers inside and then ask them, okay, run it. And when it fails, send me this output so I can analyze it. Send me the results, send me this stack trace, and I will think what actually happens there. And again, on this motivating example, let's see what IntelliJ idea tells us about this code. So if I give this code to IntelliJ, and this is Java now, so it's exactly the same code, but in Java. So IntelliJ and Java, they refuse to even compile this code. So for C++, it's okay to have uninitialized variable A. For Java, it's not even okay to have uh, A uninitialized. So they just refuse to compile. They say variable A might not have been initialized. It's not might not have, it's actually is not initialized. And the compilation just stops. You see that it's just highlights it with a red color. And I will show you the compilation result after. But pay attention to this example. In this example, as you can see, I'm using number three here and number 12 here. So actually there is no bug here. So actually A is initialized. So in this code, we don't have a problem, but IntelliJ plus Java compiler, they still complain. It just only tells us, and we will understand it further in the next few minutes, that 
the analysis they use in the Java compiler is not strong enough. It is data flow analysis, but it's not strong enough because it doesn't understand the difference between this branching and they just, just ignore the, the numbers we see in the branching. It just ignores x, x, x is more than 3, x is less than 12, it doesn't matter. It just understands that there is a, it just thinks that there is a probability of A to be uninitialized. It over approximates, let's put it this way. So it over approximates the situation and it says, I sense that A uh, may not be an uninitial, may be uninitialized, non-initialized in some situations. So I just refuse to compile. So they have data flow analysis, but it's not strong enough. Why it's not strong enough? We'll find out soon. And again, to prove the Java compiler, you just give this code exactly the same code, which is okay. Again, look at the numbers, x more than 3 and uh, x less than 12. So, of course, these two, um, two ranges, they overlap. And that's why no matter what is the x, a will definitely be initialized. However, Java compiler says variable a might not have been initialized, might not. You see, so they're just... Uh, they are not really 100% sure, but it's might, so bye-bye, we're not going to compile. It's an error. It's not a warning. It's an error. It's a definite rejection of compilation. So all of this is data flow analysis. So how they detect it? That's the question. So we will now see how they do it. How they, by looking, how Java compiler, just by looking at this code, is telling us that A is not uninitialized. So how would you do it if you would write Java compiler? how you would implement this functionality. Again, remember, they don't execute the code. They just compile line by line. They turn these lines into bytecode. And then at some point, when they reach the line which says A plus 1, they just say, hey, no, I'm not going to compile that because somewhere above that line, I kind of feel, I see, I predict that A was uninitialized. How do you do it? The methods. Let's get to the method. First step of this method, which is called data flow analysis, is turning the code into control flow graph. So you take the code on the left and you build the graph on the right. Every line, every statement on the left code becomes a block. So we go from statement, statement, we jump to so-called basic block or just block so all of these so now we have one two three four five blocks well actually the block number three can be decomposed into two blocks because we do uh, summaries that we do increment we increment the x and then we compare with uh, with five um, but for simplicity i just use one block it doesn't really matter for for the analysis so we have five blocks so how to move from here to there, that's a question outside of scope of this lecture, but we discussed it before. So we, we know how to do it, just statement by statement, representing the, the conditional branch, conditional blocks where we compare something with something and then we branch, we go either left or we go right, then we just uh, make the blocks which have uh, multiple outputs, like this one, for example. It has one output and then the, the second output. So there are two outputs from the same from the same block. We make control flow graph. Without control flow graph, you cannot continue. That's the, the first step of data flow analysis. Then you need to define six elements of this analysis method. They're not so difficult, so stay with me, I'll explain. But basically, what, what's interesting here is the first, the first sentence. So data flow analysis um, propagates information along the control flow graph. So it looks at the control flow graph and uh, in an abstract way, because we don't know exactly what, 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 will, what will happen in runtime, we can only approximate. So we approximate the movement of data from block to block, from block to block, to block. So we want to draw on the paper with the help of this method, we want to draw what potentially can happen with the data which will go from block to, bro to block. That's why it's called data flow analysis. So we analyze how the data may flow. So first of all, we need to define 
the so-called domain of the analysis. So what kind of data we're going to talk about, or basically what kind of data flow facts. That's, I like this word even more. So data flow facts. So they're not actual data in most cases, but facts about data. In our case, we're going to be interested in defined or undefined variables. So we will talk about our data flow facts will be which variable is defined. It's a fact about data. So we're not going to move the actual data of the variable. We're going to move these facts. So these, are the, these things are the domain of the analysis. The second one is the direction. The direction could be forward or backward. So you can move on the control flow graph. You can move from the top to down or you can move from the bottom to the top. We're going to use forward analysis. Just one of them. It doesn't really matter. In, in, in your projects, you can use backward as well. It's just reverse. Uh, everything will be reversed. So forward means we're going to see how the, data, how the data flow facts go from the top to down. Number three is the transfer function. So the transfer functions function is uh, the function which will answer the question uh, what happens with the input data flow facts so that they become output data flow facts for each block. So if we have a block here, for example, and the input says uh, this is the list of variables which already defined. So we say, let's say in our program, the variable x and the variable z and the variable t are defined. And then we say uh, p equals to 7. So what's going to be the output of this block? It's going to be x, z, t, and p. So it's a set, 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 set. So let's say our domain is the list, the all variables which can be defined in the program. And then this is our block, our statement. So the, 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 the transfer function will tell us how to interpret this, uh, this assignment operator. So for example, if I have another block which says, uh, I don't know, A, uh, A, uh, let's make it this one, print X. And then the input is, for example, A and B. So two variables already assigned. And then what's the output? The output will be A and B. So nothing, nothing really changes inside if our domain is a list of assigned variables. Then AB will be here and AB will be there. So the transfer function will say, I don't change anything. So usually, sometimes they, they define transfer function with so-called supplementary uh, functions or sets. They call gen or kill. So gen means how, what, what do I generate in this block and what do I kill? So this is my input. And what do I generate? What do I add to the input? And this is my output. What do I, again, kill in this output? So in this case, in case of this simple uh, transaction, then again, the, the gen function is empty and kill is empty. So I don't generate anything. I don't kill anything. Here, on this example, uh, the gen function will be uh, plus p. So we need to add p to, this, to the set and the, the, kill the kill set will be empty. So you got it. Transfer function for each. It definitely depends on the content of the block. So what stays in the block, the transfer function interprets it and do something with the, with the incoming set, with the incoming uh, data flow facts and the outcoming data flow facts. Then we have the confluence operator, so-called. The confluence operator, or sometimes there it's, a, it's a meet operator or meet function or it's a join function or join operator. Like we studied in the previous lecture, remember lattices when we had the joined and meet operators. Here in general it's called confluence operator, which means that we look, the confluence means that it, it, it joins the information which is coming. I will explain in a minute why it's meet or join. So let's say it's a block and I'm saying, um, let's say it's like this. So on this block uh, uh, something happens, for example, A equals to 1. And then here I say B equals to 1. So for here, the set which is coming into is A, right? So the variable A is assigned. Here the B is coming in. So there are two, fi two facts are coming into, uh, into, the, uh, into the block. And let's say there was an if here, if something. So if something, we assigned A or something else, we assigned B. So that was the true and that was the false condition. Imagine this code. 
I'm saying if something happens, then we assign A. If something else happens, then we assign B. So they're coming together here. Of course, definitely each, each basic, each block here generates yeah, this block, uh, this one generates A as an output, and this one generates B, the fact. So what do we do when they're coming in here? And my question is, let's say I'm saying, uh, I'm saying print A plus one. So I'm interested in this block to know whether A is defined or not defined. The confluence operator, or in this case, the meet operator must join, must meet, <laughs> must put together these two sets, A and B. So definitely the, 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 the confluence of these two sets, of these two uh, data flow facts will be, uh, as you may guess, will be because we over approximate. So it's going to be print X. So guess what it's going to be? What is your guess? It's going to be empty set. Nothing. Because we over approximate. So we say, what is the, the common, what is the common, uh, the, the, in terms of lattice, what is the, um, what's the, the greater, uh, the, 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 the greater upper bound between A and B? So definitely it's nothing. So we cannot, in an in, in, in intuitive way, intuitively, we cannot say that A is assigned or B is assigned because, because they're coming from two different uh, sources. So we cannot say about either of them for 100% that they will be assigned. So we're saying none of them will be assigned. So there is no guarantee at this point that either A or B is assigned. So we just say the guarantee is nothing. So none of them are assigned. So that's that's why it's pretty it's pretty safe to say at this point, sorry, it's pretty safe to say at this point is if we say a plus one, it's pretty it's pretty safe to issue a warning here and say no 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 a is unassigned. And this decision is made by the confluence operator, by the actually meet operator. Because remember the lattice, and the lattice, the meet operator when we join, when we go down, and the join operator when we go up. So here we go down, not because the the, the, the direction of the of the control flow follow graph is down, but because we just decided to use meet operator because logically it suits here. So logically we don't want to join. So we don't want to say that uh, if we would use join operator we would say A and B here, but that's that's incorrect. We need to use intersection. Not, uh, not the, what it's called, uh, not the join of two sets. We need to use intersection. What is the intersection between A and B? The intersection is empty set. Okay. Uh, number five, what do we do? We need to define boundary condition. Boundary condition is basically what do we start? What is the start? Uh, what is the start uh, data flow effect? So from which data flow fact we start the whole analysis. So what comes at the top? Usually it's an empty set or it's a set which contains all uh, the entire domain. So usually people uh, use either this or that. We will use empty set in the further analysis. And then initial values. So initial values means the, uh, again, which data flow facts we're going to assume as, a, as an input for each uh, for each block in the control flow, flow graph. You may ask me a question, what do you mean assume? If we go from the top, we go down. So data flow facts, they're supposed to flow from the top to the down. So what kind of assume? So why do we need to assume something there? And I can tell you that sometimes you're going to have a block which has uh, the input, uh, the, the input uh, arrows coming from the bottom. So let's say you have a, have a loop. So let's say let me destroy that. Let's say you have this uh, this control flow, like like we had before, like we had in this our example. So let's say you have this block. Uh, the arrow is coming here, and then uh, and then the arrow. Uh, let's put it this way. One thing like this, and then from here we have an input from there. So that's possible to see in a control flow graph. And then we start the anal analysis. And for example, the input here is A. So it's coming there. So we see the A. 
And then we're asking the, before we go to the transfer function, we need to do the meet function. So we, we need to, uh, we need to, uh, I'm trying always to use the word join, but it's probably incorrect. So we try, we need to, uh, uh, to put them together. All the known input facts, we need to put them together. And for this, we need to use the, uh, the meet function. But what's here? So what do we put A together with what? On our you know, first flow, on the first iteration of our data flow analysis. So we need something here. This is the initial value. So here we say, in all our analysis, the initial values are going to be empty sets. So when you start the analysis, you just go down, 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 you meet the block, you see this is the input coming from there, and also the input coming from, from, the, from the side, but that one already has the initial value, which is, again, usually it's either the empty set or it's the, uh, the entire domain, you know, the entire, uh, the entire domain of all data flow facts. If this domain is D, then D is here. So we need to, before we start data flow analysis, we need to make a decision about these six things. So let's see how it works. So let's say we analyze our control flow graph and we made the six decisions. We want, remember what we want. We want to define, we want to find out whether A will be defined, will be assigned or not assigned, and this is the graph. So first decision, domain. The domain will be the will contain variable names. So in, in, in a simple in a simple you know uh, in a simple world will be x and a. There are two variables, so that the entire domain is just two two things which which we're going to deal with. The direction of analysis is forward, so we go from top to bottom. The transfer function is simple. We just say when you meet this operator, when we meet this syntax, then just add a new element. To the you know to the output uh, to the output data flow fact you take the input data flow fact if you if you see this then just add what you see to the uh, to the uh, to the set don't delete anything never you only add so basically the transfer function will only work here and it will work here it will I mean work mean do something useful in all other situations in all other in all other blocks like here here and here transfer function will, do, will don't do anything, it will just take what's coming and send it further. Uh, confluence operator, we're going to use meet, so in other words, it's going to be intersection, like we just discussed. So we're going to intersect. If there are two things coming in and they're different, so we find the intersection between them, and that's reasonable, I believe. The boundary condition, we're going to start with x. So we say that when the analysis starts, we're going to say that x is already defined. Which is logical, right? Because it's a function, so the function in a, in, a C, in a C++ code, it was function f, and x was the input parameter, so input parameter already is defined, so we can say that boundary condition is x. And initial values. Initial values will be empty sets, so it will be empty, empty, uh, empty, so we, put, we, we can put these things right here everywhere. So they're like initial values, and that's how we start the analysis. And now let's do the analysis and see how it works. But before, yeah, before we go, uh, maybe an extra slide to again reiterate what is the meet operator. So again, it's coming from the lattice. Remember in lattice we discussed this was the, the meet operator uh, in the lattice. Uh, and uh, you remember what was the uh, what was the idea. So the meet means that uh, if you take, uh, let's say, two elements from the set, then you just, between these two elements, you just find out what is the lower, uh, what is the greater upper bound? So what is the maximum, what is the highest element in the lattice, which, can, which, which is reachable from these two elements which we select? So between these two, let's, let's answer, let's find the, the, the answer um, for these uh, two, three questions. So what is the, the, the greater upper bound between these, I'm asking you about that, between X and A and X? So the, I'm asking X and A and X, uh, sorry, and, uh, and this one. So what is? The answer is X, right? Second question, what is the, what is the, between A and the empty set? It's uh, empty set, right? And what is between A and X? 
a and x it is empty set right So just for you to understand why we, on the previous lecture, we spent some time discussing abstract interpretation and these lattices. Now we use them. So actually when we define the domain for the data flow analysis, we also define the lattice on this domain. So we define relationship between these data flow facts. Because without this relationship, we will not be able to, uh, to do the... Uh, the, 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 we will not be able to put together the facts. So the analysis, the data flow analysis is uh, basically, um, is, is sort of, we discussed that on the previous lecture a little bit. So how we do it? We just uh, put some facts, uh, let's say we have, we know something here, and then we look at the transfer function on the block, and then we create some another fact, and then we create another fact, and then we create another fact, and so we just go up to down, creating different facts. And then we see fact number four, then we create fact number five, fact number six, and then we go back, we create fact number seven, and then we start from the beginning. So we go up to this level again, and we'll look, okay, fact number, fact number zero, then fact number two, fact three, fact four, fact four, they stay unchanged. So let's say there was the fact number, I missed it, so let's say it's three. <laughs> with a with a prime and then we look at this block again and we know okay there's fact three fact three prime and fact four so there's three facts are coming in so what in this case will be f5 definitely it's not going to be f5 anymore so we we scratch that so it's not uh it's not f5 anymore we scratch that we say it's f8 then we say okay f8 is here so what's going to be the output of there so it's not going to be f7 we scratch that, it's going to be F9. Okay, good. We finish that, and then it's going to be not F8, but not F6. F it's going to be F10. Okay, we'll look at this again, and we go from scratch again, from the beginning. We go up to this point again, to the starting point. We start again. F0, not changed. F2, the same. F3, the same. This is the same. This is the same. But look, Again, this one, two, this one is changed. Now it's not F4 anymore. It's not F7, it's F9. Okay, because we have F3, F3 prime and F9, then the output will be different. So we change this again. So it's going to be F11 or whatever. And this one is changed. It's going to be F12 and so on and so forth. So we go again, again, again. We iterate and iterate multiple, multiple times until we reach a fixed point. What is the fixed point? Fixed point means that this F, these facts, they stop changing. So no matter how many times you go, they just, they just stop. So you make a new circle, the new cycle, new iteration, and all of them stay the same. At this point, you just stop and you say, okay, now let's take a look at this fact. And this is the result of the analysis. What's left, what's there, is actually the information, is the over approximation of the of the situation with this code. That's the idea of data flow analysis. Many, many. Well, there is an also another approach which, uh, which may optimize this, uh, these iterations is the, um, the so-called um, work, list, work list algorithm. Uh, we're not going to discuss it on this lecture, but just know that the name this, it exists, which helps you a little bit, not a little bit, a lot, to optimize this um, incremental iterative approach. It makes it faster. That's it. But the idea will stay the same. It's still the same concept. You just iterate multiple times until you know, all the facts uh, stop uh, changing. So why they change? Because like I showed you, like I showed you, when you make loops, when you make circles, then uh, what's coming from the bottom on the next iteration of the entire flow will need to get together, will need to meet with the previous facts. So the previous facts, they already existed, and then the new facts are coming from there, so we need to meet them somehow to generate, to, 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 to get new facts, and then pass these new facts to, to, transfer, uh, to transfer functions and produce new facts. That's why we need a lattice. Because the question is, how do you meet? How do you decide how to put these two different facts together in order to produce the new fact? There has to be some rule, some, some principle, and that's the lattice helps. If you define the lattice before, then it's going to be easy. You just take, this is, for example, fact number one, and this is fact number nine. So what's going to be the resulting fact? The resulting fact will be this one. It's going to be fact 13. So from this, 
plus this will lead you to that. Easy. The decision is easy to make if you have the lattice. So about this gen and kill functions, like I told you, people use them sometimes in order to define the transfer function. You can, I can make an example just with this one. So like we discussed, so these are the statements. So we have statement number one, statement two, statement three, statement four, statement uh, five. And these are the gen and the kill uh, sets. Uh, that's a mistake here. It should be S. It should be S. That's my mistake. So uh, let's take a look at the first one. X is more than 10. We're talking about this particular statement. X is more than 10. What is the gen? What is the kill? What is? What do we generate? What do we put? What extra facts we can generate? Nothing. We don't generate anything. So it's empty set. Empty set. So we don't kill anything from our list of facts and we don't generate any facts. We just, because no variables are assigned at this particular line. But remember, it only relates, this definition of a transfer function only relates to our current data flow analysis because we decided to use uh, assigned variables as the domain for the analysis. Because of that, we make the definition of this particular transfer function. You can, you can do different things. On the data flow analysis, you can define the domain your way. You can say, for example, I'm interested to see uh, not, the, the, not the, the which variables are defined, but for example, I'm interested to see uh, which uh, expressions were used already. We're going to discuss in the end of this lecture, we're going to discuss what kind of data flow analysis you can use. So one of them is the, the uh, so-called analysis of available expressions. So you just say that, uh, I mean, we're going to discuss this in the future. So just remember now that the definition of this, of this table, it depends on the, on the domain, definitely. It depends on the domain of data flow analysis. Another line, the second line, this one, it says A equals to 42. So what's going to be the gen function? The gen will be definitely this one. So it generates one extra fact. So there's not a function there. Probably use the proper word is the sets. So there are two sets, gen and, gen and kill. So there are two sets, sets of facts. So A in this case is a fact. So we generate new fact that A was assigned. That's a fact. All right, and so on and so forth. So, um, so take a look, the final notice about that, we need to understand that it is over approximation. So uh, this data flow analysis, which we just did with this lattice, with this lattice, and with this approach, which I just demonstrated you, where we go from the top to the bottom, we can, we can do it right now. So let's do the analysis. We'll just go step by step. So we see the lattice on the right, and let's start from the beginning. So in the beginning, we, our, our only fact is that X, X is defined. Then we go here, on this, on this line we say x stays, right? Nothing changes, so nothing happens. Here x stays the same. Then here we say x and a. So we add a, it's an extra fact there, because a is defined, is assigned, so we put a to the list of facts. Then we go next line. We say x less than, nothing changes, x, a. Here also x, a. Then we say a equals to uh, a equals to uh, S. So the output will be A. Oh, sorry. I made a mistake. Oops. Stop, stop, stop. So look at this. We have X here and X and A here. So they had two facts are coming into this statement. So the, the transfer function will take X, will take X and A, meet them. And the result of this meeting will be only X. So the X will, will come here and will continue to go in here and will continue to go in here. Then what's coming from the a equals to x? It's coming a, x and a, right? This is the first flow, the first iteration. We go up again. We start, we start again from here. So we take x is here, x is, x is there, everything is fine. So now we have three inputs to this block, to this one. We say x, x and a, and x and a. What's the meat of them? The meat is x just x. So the output will be again x, the same, again x, the same, nothing changes. So we can go again a few times, we have a re we, we reached the fixed point, the end of the analysis. 
So the end of the analysis, and what do we have? We have x coming here, but then we use a in there. So that's a bug. So we can raise a, a warning and say, hey, our data flow analysis just found out that to this block, only the x will arrive as, a, as an assigned variable. If we do exactly the same analysis on this control flow graph, which has different numbers here, we will get exactly the same result. Again, the x will be the only data flow fact coming to this block. And again, we're going to raise the warning here, which is wrong. But this is the result of over approximation and pass insensitivity. We're going to discuss now what is pass insensitivity. But you need to understand what is over approximation. So we, we, raise, we raise, this is what Java compiler is doing. So Java compiler is over approximating. It doesn't care basically what's in these blocks. So it doesn't care about these operators. It just sees the block and it sees that the block is not assigning the variable. That's it. That's the information it cares about. It doesn't care about what else is happening in the block. It just says, okay, this block is not touching the variable A. That's enough for me to know. And I continue. And if I over approximate the behavior like this, ignoring the, the, the things which are happening there and only paying attention to some things, then you get what you get. You get Java compiler, which is not smart enough to understand that these, bla these control flow graph and this one are different. This one is definitely is an error and this one is okay, but they don't care because they are pass insensitive. We're going to discuss it now, what it means, pass insensitive. So there are sensitivities. In data flow analysis, there are things which are called sensitivities. Sensitivities, I, I've heard about a few of them. We're going to discuss just three. So the sensitivity number one is pass sensitivity. It's exactly what we just saw uh, in the example of this, of this simple control flow, control flow graph analysis. So a pass sensitive analysis, pass sensitive analysis. Our analysis was insensitive. So it didn't care it didn't care of the, uh, they didn't care um, uh, on what is happening in the, this, uh, uh, the conditional branching blocks. For our analysis, insensitive, pass insensitive, it was, it was not important, uh, it was not important which way the block goes, and it was, it was producing exactly the same output for the same, uh, the transfer function, whatever transfer function is saying, it was just copying that output to both branches. So here, for example, if the X is coming here and um, I don't know, something, the fact is fact number one is coming here and then the transfer function produces fact number two, then fact number two uh, goes in both, uh, on both output lines. While pass sensitive analysis, it depends on the predicates on the predicates at conditional branch instructions. So it will produce fact number uh, three, fa sorry, fact number two here, and the fact number three here, depending on the, uh, depending on the, uh, on the result of the, of the predicate, which is, uh, which they, which, which it can get from here. And then the past sensitive analysis is actually not only dealing with the facts, with the data flow facts, but also attaches the predicates to the facts. So it's going to be, it's going to look, I imagine that, I've never implemented it myself, but I believe that past sensitive analysis will say, this is fact number two plus the predicate, x is more than three. And here it's going to be fact number three, it's going to be fact number three plus the predicate s is x is less, less or equal than three, and then these, this guy, and this guy, they will travel further. Not just f f f like we did before, facts facts facts, but facts with predicates. So they travel together, and of course we need to be more uh, specific on the meet function. So when these guys meet, then we need to decide how these predicates will match. And according to this, we make the decisions. That's what past sensitive analysis is about. You can try it. You can try to implement that with a very simple piece of code, very simple control flow graph, and, and uh, implement it first with the pass insensitive way. 
and see how it behaves, what's going to be the result. You will be surprised. Well, it's going to work for some, for some simple cases and they will definitely be important to see. And then try to make it insensitive. Attach the predicates. That's what, that's what, the, you know, that's what it's, uh, the book examples, they, they, they say that uh, pass sensitivity means predicates go together with the facts about data. Another type of sensitivity is a so-called flow-sensitive analysis. Flow-sensitive and flow-insensitive. So what we did before was flow-sensitive. So we did a good way. We did a good analysis. Our analysis, which, which I explained to you before, was flow-sensitive. Meaning that, look at the example here. Uh, there's, there's three lines of code. On the first line I say a equals to zero. Then I say a equals to five. And then I say a equals five, a plus one. So let's say we try to build an analyzer which will tell us what is the possible value of A. What can be the possible value here at this line, at line number four. Or maybe sometimes the question will be, is it possible to have A as zero here? So let's say somewhere here I have a line which says B divided by A. So I'm interested to know whether this division by zero may happen. So that's why I'm asking the question, is it possible that here will be zero? And if the analyzer is flow insensitive, so it doesn't care about the, 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 the way, it doesn't care how instructions go one after another. In this case, at this line, probably the answer will be that A could be zero. Uh, it's going to be the set of facts. It could be zero, it could be five, and it could be one, and it could be six. Because zero was seen here, zero was seen here, then 5 just added to the list of facts. 5 was there. And then, okay, here was a plus 1. So what is it? It was 0 plus 1. Or maybe it's 5 plus 1. So there are 6 possible values at this point. Again, over approximation. Of course, if you look at this code intuitively, you can see that a can only be 6. So this is the only possible value. But flow insensitive analysis will not see that. Flow insensitive will just collect the information uh, not paying attention to if, if it was happening before, then you need to delete some information from the previous uh, basic block and then uh, don't propagate it further into the next basic block. So it basically may happen, this flow insensitive analysis may happen if your transfer function is not properly deleting the information which was coming from the previous, uh, from the previous blocks. So this, this, remember these kill sets. They... Uh, the kill set, which is which is taking which is looking at what's happening in the in this in this block, and then deleting the previous facts. So if you don't delete them properly, then you're going to get this. That's basically you accumulate facts. The more you accumulate, the better for you. You may think, and then in the end, you're going to get such a huge over approximation, which is uh, quite uh, unreasonable because you will have an answer here. Yes, it's possible to divide by zero. So, as you remember from the previous lecture, it's going to be called a uh, false positive answer from your analyzer. So, you're claiming there is a bug, but it's false. False claim. Why it happens? Because your kill set is defined incorrectly. You don't kill the necessary, the facts which you have to kill. Another type of sensitivity, number three, which there exist more types of sensitivity. I can guarantee you that. You can, you can learn them yourself. So, next one is um, context sensitive analysis. So context sensitivity means um, it, is, it is related to interprocedural analysis. Let me step aside and explain what, what is interprocedural analysis means. So there are two types of analysis, again, two categories of data flow analysis, or not only data flow, just uh, static analysis. Interprocedural, interprocedural, and intraprocedural. Interprocedural means that we analyze what's happening, this one, I'm talking about this one, it means we analyze what's happening between functions. So we analyze one function and then if the call is made to another function, we just go there and see what happens there. Another call is made there, we just go to another function and see what happens there. This is inter-procedural, like internet, so we're just uh, going to different uh, different locations. Intra-procedural analysis means that we always stay inside one function. So we never go anywhere else. We just see the call made to another function. We ignore it. We don't jump there. We just continue to analyze the function which we see. So this is definitely easier. 
This is definitely much more simple intra, intra procedural analysis. But of course, less powerful because you ignore the facts which you can collect from, from the functions which you can also analyze next to the function you're looking at right, mo right now at the moment. So, uh, so when the, the, the analysis is interprocedural, procedure to procedure, then it may either consider the, uh, the, the information coming from the call site. So they call it call site. So the call site is where the call is made to. Or we can ignore this information. So look at this, at this code. We just, we're interested to see, is it possible to it happens that x is equals to y when the function is called? So if you analyze it in a context insensitive way, then the answer will be yes, it's possible. Because you will just look at everything, all the data flow facts which you can find everywhere in the code, and you will, uh, uh, you will not see how these facts are combined in a specific call site. So you will just see all of these call sites, but you, they will be not, you will not pay attention to what's happening in, in them specifically. You will just, in general, collect the information. You will say, okay, I know that x may be equals to 5, maybe equals to 6. Okay, so for x, what are my facts? 5 and 6. For, for y, again, 6 and 5. So here I have 6 and 5. And then the question is, can they, is it possible to have x equals to, to y? Of course, we just compare these two, uh, two sets, and the answer is obvious. Yeah, they can be. Because in this information which you collected, there is no information about context, about where the calls were made, from which call sites. So this information is lost. You ignored it. You over-approximated. You said, I don't care. If you don't care, you have less precision. You, you decrease the precision of your analysis. So when people make context-sensitive analysis, they, they, they store this information somewhere. Again, they attach this information to data flow facts. So all we store is facts. So in this data flow analysis, all we do is we go through the control flow graph and collect facts, collect and store, Col and attach to the graph. We don't store them anywhere. We just attach to the graph. On each line in the graph, we attach and enrich the information which we can collect. So when you, when you enrich this information, you can enrich it with predicates, like I showed you with the past sensitive analysis. Here, you can enrich this information with the data about call sites. So who called, when called, in which combination the parameters were provided, that, that gives you extra context. And that extra context can be further analyzed. That's, uh, that's the idea. Okay, and uh, we are getting to the last, the most interesting part of the lecture is the most common types of uh, analysis. There are fives. I'm going to show you fives and then five types of analysis and then we finish up. So data flow analysis, how practically it can help us with the, with the, with the writing code. First type of analysis, so-called reaching definitions analysis. So we are interested to know uh, which definitions may reach a given point in the code. Definition means uh, a definition of a, uh, of a variable. A definition of a variable. So take a look at this code and tell me if you see any problems with this code. Is everything okay or it's not okay. So first line, we lowered the price of the book. Well, the book is coming in here. The book ID, probably. So we need to calculate what is the price. So first we lowered the price from the database. Then if the book number is less than 10, we set the price to another number. If the price is more than 50, then we set to another number. Then we have a discount, and then we multiply the price of the book by the discount. So the question here is, uh, not the question, the problem. So what is, what is wrong with this code? What is the bug which we can point out to? Yeah, the problem is that we don't need to load this from the database, I believe. Because because this value, even if it's, I mean, it will be overwritten either by this line or by that line. So there is no point of going to the database and downloading the price. 
right? So it's like a extra step, which programmer probably made by mistake. And we may uh, correct this mistake. So in order to do this, we do the reaching definition analysis. The reaching definition analysis can do this. You can look at any line of the code, for example, this line, and you will ask, what is the closest, the closest definition of the, uh, for, for each particular variable? So let's say this is discount. So which line, if I go up on the code, which line was the, the closest one to me, which defined the value of this variable? And I say this one. So for discount, it's this one. So the, it was set there. What happened before, I don't care. We don't go up. We just, we just see the closest one. Okay, now let's ask the same question for a variable P. So what was the closest line? We can say it was this line or it was that line, depending on the predicate. But if the analysis is past sensitive, then it will say that this line was never, is not the, uh, the reaching definition of the, of the variable. And that means that this line can be deleted, as far as I understand. I hope I explained it correctly, because I'm, I'm a little bit uh, uncertain about this example in particular, even though I wrote it. Um, I ask you to learn it yourself, this particular type of analysis, reaching definition analysis. But from the definition, it says, yes, it's the data flow analysis which statically determines which definitions may reach a given point in the code. So I'm asking, so which definition? Ah, maybe, maybe, uh, yeah, so, so basically the, the problem I described correctly. The problem is that this line is, is unnecessary, but maybe the definition should go in a different direction. So we may say that uh, what definitions may reach this point. So this one will never be able to reach this line so it's so it's definitely overwritten by this and that so you got the idea <laughs> that can be detected by data flow analysis but i ask you to study this one yourself second one called liveness analysis uh, liveness analysis we check it helps us to understand uh, which variables are alive alive at each point in the program live means that they hold values that may be needed in the future so in this analysis, we look at the variable and we say, do we still need this variable or it can be destroyed because nobody needs them in the future. Again, look at the code. Do you see any problems with this code? Again, we're trying to calculate the price of the book. Uh, we define two variables here and then we say if book is more than 400, then we set the discount to 10. Then we load the price from the database and we say the price is uh, the, the price we downloaded, multiplied by something, multiplied, and then we return the price. So it looks like this variable is, uh, is here, it is dead. Because nobody needs this variable anymore in the code below. So we, we stored the number in there, but uh, there is no point in, in doing that because nobody is actually using this variable in the further code. So we can easily raise a warning here and say, hey, probably you forgot that this code can be safely deleted. So this code is dead. How did we understand the code is dead? Because we were using liveness analysis. So we, we, it's, it's, you can implement it. And this kind of analysis, actually, you have to uh, do the backward analysis, not the forward one, but backward analysis. Again, you can try to do it yourself. Think what's going to be the domain of the analysis, what, what's going to be the transfer function, um, how you're going to organize the, the relationship between, this, uh, between the elements of the domain, about the, the data flow facts. So what's going to be the, the, the meet function or the join function? Think about it. But I know that this, life, this liveness analysis is usually going, not usually, but it's going backward. So you analyze from the, from the bottom to the, to the beginning of the control flow graph. So it helps us to understand which variable is uh, alive and which one is, uh, is dead. Liveness analysis. Another one called definite assignment analysis. We, I believe, just did it. So we did the, in the 
previous part of the lecture, we did the analysis um, for, uh, for, like it said, we ensure that a variable or location, variable location means, you know, piece in code, is always assigned before it is used. Again, take a look at the practical example of this code. So what do you see here? We say we calculate the salary of a user. We check if the user is more than 400, then we download the salary from the database. If the user is less than 400, then the salary is zero. And then we return the S. So do you see any problem with this code? So we make a decision. If it's more than 400, then we download. If it's less than 400, we I just say, okay, your salary is zero. So if you go this code, if you, if you give this code to, uh, to Java, then Java will complain, definitely. It's not going to compile it. Uh, well, because why? Because the Java will see if here and if there. So uh, if you put the else in there, and then you say s equals to, I don't know, 111, then Java will compile. But without this else, Java thinks that you made one branch and another branch, but in the third case, what's in the third case? The Java doesn't like that, so it's going to complain. Uh, in case of uh, if the analysis would be more smart, so try to give this code to ChatGPT, and you will see that you will see what ChatGPT will tell you. So probably ChatGPT will understand what's going on, and it will tell you that you forgot the value of user ID, which is equal to 400. So what happens when it's more than 400, you define. If it's less than 400, you define. But if it's equal to 400, this particular decision is not made in this code, and it means that the variable is not, uh, is not assigned. Or, without ChatGPT, you can create a, a data flow analyzer, which is, like we discussed, it's pass sensitive. So it's going to understand that this is one predicate, this is another predicate, but there is a missing part between these two predicates, so it's possible to, uh, to have the, the user ID, which, will, which doesn't match either of these uh, predicates. And in this case, uh, the variable will be unassigned. Got it. That's what, uh, that's what data flow analysis is for, to, uh, to, make, that, to make that kind of, uh, to spot that kind of errors in the code. Another one called available expression analysis. Available expression helps you to, um, to determine, not you, but the compiler. It helps the compiler. In this case, we're not looking for bugs. We're using data flow analysis to help the compiler evaluate your code faster. And this is actually quite useful uh, domain for data flow analysis, not only to find bugs, but to help compilers optimize their code. So program analysis is not only used to detect bugs, but also used to help... Uh, uh, well, actually, there are also bugs, right? So if the code cannot be executed as fast as it's possible, then it's, it's a bug. It's not functional bug, it's a non-functional bug. So the performance is lower than it's possible. So let's say it's a bug. We can call it this way. That's pretty legal to, to call it this way. So look at the code in front of you. Again, we calculate the price of the book, so we take the book ID here, and then we say if, and we go to the stock, and we calculate how many books we have in the stock. We have less than 100. Okay, in this case, we do like 19. We get the price 19. Then we check, okay, if in the stock we have more than 1,000 books, then the price is lower, five, 9. And in other case, the P will be equal to 14. What's wrong with this code? The question is, shall we compute stock twice? Because in this case, we, we're going to make two round trips to the database. We will go once, and then if it's not, then we go again. So if this condition is not satisfied, this particular predicate, if, if it's false, then we're going to jump into this one. And again, in this predicate, we're going to calculate this expression. So this guy will be calculated twice in this code. Well, on certain situations, not always, but it may happen that it will be calculated twice. Available expression analysis can help you identify expressions which are already calculated. How they do it? The domain of this analysis will include all expressions that are seen in the code. So they're not any more variables like we did before, but expressions. Expressions. 
and when you draw the graph of this, uh, the, 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 the graph of this uh, control flow graph, then you may see something like this. There will be the block which says, uh, I don't know, if stock, blah, blah, blah. Then the input will be empty, nothing. Let's probably do it like this. So the empty is no data flow fact, but the output is going to contain it's going to contain, let me write it properly, it's going to be a set of, and the set we will see stock ID, book ID, and so this is the first data flow fact, the fact that this expression has already been evaluated, and then we continue to the next block, to the next block, and you will see there that uh, this information will be uh, at the bottom, at some particular block, the information will be already there, this, it's going to be on the input line to the block that this expression is already calculated. And when the compiler will compile that particular block at the bottom, then it will see, okay, in the incoming line there, this expression says that expression has already been calculated and, and, um, um, uh, and we can use it in some, you know, in some collection of pre-calculated expressions, whatever. Or maybe we can somehow optimize the code so that we, I don't know, we just... Uh, put this data in stack on stack and then we just take it from stack. It depends on the compiler. But at least this information will be there. Because imagine, imagine the huge function, a function which is 100 lines long. And at the beginning of this function you calculate some expression. And then you continue, 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 and then you use this expression again. Not like in this code where they stay close to each other. And you may think like why compiler cannot see it. But imagine the function is long. And the compiler is looking at line by line. So the compiler transfers line by line into the bytecode and the binary code. So how the compiler will understand that what was seen on the top is now can be used at the bottom. That's exactly the same expression. And remember that expressions cannot be, may not necessarily be that simple like in this case. Because in this case you may say just create a table, just create a, a catalog of functions which are already called and that's it. But imagine that, that in this code, for example, book ID is mutable. Because in this code it's immutable. So it's pretty safe to just save the, to just store somewhere the result of this uh, evaluation of the function stock and that's it. But imagine the book ID is a mutable variable and the function is 100 lines long. So we calculated the stock with the book ID something and then down the line, down the, you know, going down through the function, we man, we, we, we uh, change the book ID and then again call stock ID. So compiler has to somehow collect the knowledge of all of this. So data flow analysis is how they do it. They just go through the graph and that these gen and kill functions, they're pretty smart, these transfer functions, they understand uh, which, um, which facts, uh, and at, at which particular situation they can, they need to destroy uh, the, the, the available expression from the, the expression from the list of available expressions from the, from the, from the facts, from data flow facts. So it's all about these gen and kill functions. What, what do you generate? What do you kill? And if you carefully generate and kill, then the multiple iterations of the data flow analysis will finally will give you the right information. Well, over approximated, of course, at which point, which expression is available for you. Okay, and the final analysis number five called constant propagation analysis. Again, it is uh, quite useful for a compiler. Uh, so it, uh, at each line, it tells us which variable is a constant. And uh, a constant means that uh, you know, every execution that reaches this point gives the variable the same value. So uh, let's take a look at the example. We calculate the discount which we can give to this particular price. So the price is coming as an argument. Okay, it's a typo here, so it should be not P but price. So we say, we, we define discount as this one, as 0. Uh, as 0 0.8. And then we say, if the price is less than 15 or 14.99, then discount is this. Otherwise, the discount is this. And then we multiply uh, the price by the discount. So what do you think is wrong with this? Is there an error? Do you see any error in this code? as a programmer. There is no error per se, I would say there is no actually, because the, the code will work, 
the code's functionality is correct. However, if you look close to this code and if you make a pass sensitive analysis of this, you will see that the D will always be uh, 0 0.93 here, no matter what happens. Because this code, you see, it doesn't matter what is the price, the D will be calculated exactly the same every time. So this is actually a constant. And imagine that if this code, for example, this line would be very expensive. For example, that would be not just a simple comparison, but I don't know, a trip to the database then definitely we would need to tell the client, that tell the programmer that you did something wrong. There's a constant here, so there is no point of, of all this code. It just doesn't make sense. You can delete it safely and just leave it one line and put the, the, the constant in this, in this position. So this, propag this constant propagation analysis can go through the, through the control flow graph and, uh, and, and find out uh, that uh, that the information is uh, that, that some variables, even though they look like variables, so they're mutable, so something is written there, something is uh, modified there, but in reality they're not. In reality, in the end, down the line, it, it's going to keep the same number there. And that's quite useful. It, it may help the, com the compiler, it may just uh, tell the compiler that uh, all of this code just doesn't make sense, so just ignore it. So the compiler can just uh, quietly ignore it and just put the number there and call it a day. Or the compiler can issue a warning and actually suggest the programmer to modify the code because maybe the programmer actually wanted to do something. For example, here, let's say the programmer not only compares something, but also here, uh, not only setting the price, but also making some, uh, I don't know, SQL uh, insert. So it goes to the database and makes some modifications to the data. So in this case, it's, we, we don't know what to do. The compiler cannot just ignore this block because in this case, it will just delete this functionality, which may be important. So the compiler has to at least, you know, have to suggest that programmer to, hey, do something with this D because it, it, kind of, it kind of confuses me as a, program, as a compiler. It tells me that, that something is uh, wrong with the code, but I, but I cannot ignore your code because I see that you're doing something else there. So constant propagation can, uh, can do very good, uh, can help uh, comp compilers, not only uh, static analyzers. So that's probably it. I suggest you to watch and read. So there's the one book and the slides, and another is a very good course by uh, Michael uh, Pradell on YouTube, which was about data flow analysis with more practical examples than I gave you. Because, well, because he's, he knows way more than I do in this area and because he has uh, five lectures about this topic, not just one. So his information is much more advanced. So watch it and uh, see how it works with you. This kind of analysis is, in my opinion, the simplest and the, the easiest to implement. Uh, you can just, as, as soon as you, as long as you have control flow graph, the rest is a piece of cake. The, the question will be always how to generate control flow graph as I understand. The rest is, you know, it's implementable in just a few hours. If you have the control flow graph in memory in a, in a good format so you can easily traverse the graph, jump from the, uh, from the node to node, then the rest, define the domain, define the transfer function, define this mid operator, boom. In a few hours you have the analyzer. So how do you get the control flow, flow graph for, for the language you want to analyze? That's the question. That's you need to, this is what you need to find out. As long as you get it, then make many, many, many steps for analysis without many, many types of analysis without any, uh, any big problem.